Hello and welcome to Happier, a podcast about how to be happier. This week, in honor of the fifth anniversary of my book, The Four Tendencies, we will talk about the tendencies. Get ready. And Elizabeth, you give yourself a back to school demerit. Uh, one, I think we've all done it. <laughs> I'm Gretchen Rubin, a writer who studies happiness, good habits, the four tendencies in human nature. I'm in New York City, and joining me today from L.A. is my sister, Elizabeth Kraft, who is one of my very favorite obligers. That's me, Elizabeth Kraft, a TV writer and producer living in L.A., and Gretch, happy anniversary. Thank you. That's very exciting. Very exciting. I can't believe we lived without the four tendencies. How, I know, how did we stumble along? <laughs> but I want to point out for uh, for people on YouTube, I'm wearing the very first Upholder yeah. t-shirt that you gave yeah. me. You made, you ordered it specially yes. for me. You love, you love a custom mug and a custom t-shirt. Yes. And I'll post a picture too in the episode notes. But I still wear my Upholder t-shirt with pride. Yay. That was a great gift. And Gretchen, before we get to the four tendencies, Rebecca wrote in about the five senses exercise that we did in episode 387, the portrait of the five senses. Yeah. She says, I was intrigued by your five senses exercise that you did for each other in episode 387. My mom has early onset dementia. She can remember who we are and her routines, but asking her about the past or present leaves her feeling muddled and she deflects the question. I learned in a dementia education course that verbal communication is not effective for people with dementia, as well as some tools to use other senses to communicate instead. So I thought I'd take a shot with the five senses exercise and I roped my brother into helping. Together we made a document of three to five memories around each of the five senses and for her birthday, since we weren't sure we could read it ourselves without getting emotional, we had her read it instead. You could tell she didn't remember everything, but some memories really sparked a response and lots of laughs and she was touched at what we did right. I currently can't visit because I'm immigrating to the United States, but the rest of my family was there with her and I watched over FaceTime. I heard from both my dad and brother how happy she was after the fact. Having these memories written down means she can squirrel this paper away somewhere and keep rediscovering it as she often does with other old letters. And the next week, I was surprised on one of my regular phone calls for her to talk about her Chanel Number no. 5 powder. Normally, our phone calls follow a very familiar beat, and this was new. This was one of my scent memories for her. She kept that powder in the top drawer, even when it was empty, because you could still open it and smell the perfume, and I would wander into her room as a child just to snoop in her top drawer and find that powder. Well, she'd gone and found the powder case. She likely didn't remember why she had to go find it, but with the timing, I can't help but think it got her brain firing and sent her on a little adventure. Gifts don't really work anymore, and with dementia, you can really only count on having the present moment with her, which is a gift for us, even if we know she won't remember it beyond that moment. I feel like this is one gift that will keep on giving, not only to us, but to her as well. That's such a great idea. It's so, and it's such a great way to connect with someone with dementia. And it's very practical, but it's also very transcendent. You know, yes. it really ties us to our memories. So that was wonderful. So, yes. So thank you, Rebecca. And then switching into the four tendencies, I wanted to let everybody know that in honor of the four tendencies anniversary, I have created gift boxes that are curated for each of the tendency. So whether you're this. an upholder, a questioner, a obliger, <laughs> rebel, um, you can get a tendency box and it has a mug with your tendency and your motto and a sticker, a tackle box, which there's something for all the tendencies in the tackle box. And there's this new four tendencies companion guide that I've put together. And it's a collection of new interviews that only appear in this companion guide, plus like a lot of insights and, and journal prompts to help you think through your own tendency, how to harness it. So the idea is that for some people, they'd like to buy this for themselves. They want to <laughs> wear their tendency with pride. Or it's also as a gift, because I think a lot of times people enjoy giving somebody the gift set like, oh, you're yes. my favorite obliger, Elizabeth. I'll give you an obliger box. You can go to happiercast.com slash 4T collection. And if you also want to include the Four Tendencies book, the actual book with it, 
you get 10% off when you buy them together. Uh, and the discount is applied automatically at checkout. I think a lot of people who buy the gift boxes probably already have the book. So I wanted you right. to be able to decide what, you know, if it's a gift and someone needs the book, you can add it. But I didn't want people to have to buy it if they already if they already owned it. So check out the gift boxes. That's so fun. I love a gift box, Gretch. I just the word gift box makes me happy. I know, happier. makes you happy. So true. And this week, our Try This at Home tip is, no surprise, to use the four tendencies to make your life happier, healthier, more productive, more creative, and to help you deal with other people with less stress, less strife, less confusion, less resentment. The four tendencies really can be a very effective tool. Yeah. So Gretchen, this came out September 12th, five years yeah. ago. My yeah. question is, does it seem shorter or longer? To me, it seems longer. It seems like this has been around forever. Well, that's a great question. I think like many things, it seems both longer and shorter. Like in a way, I remember distinctly like the very moment I was sitting in this chair right here, mm -hmm. right exactly where I'm now, where I got the big insight into the four tendencies. But then I also feel like I've been thinking about it for decades. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, it feels like both. And now in case anyone's listening who doesn't know what the four tendencies are, or if anyone needs a brush up, Gretch, can yeah. you just explain the basic concept? Yeah. So this is looking at something that sounds boring, I have to admit, but it turns out to be really juicy, which is how you respond to expectations. So all of us face two kinds of expectations, outer expectations like a work deadline and inner expectations like my own desire to keep a New Year's resolution. So depending on whether you meet or resist outer and inner expectations, that's what makes you an upholder like me, a questioner like my husband, Jamie, an obliger like you, or a rebel like Chris Gillibo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. They meet the work deadline. They keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want to know what other people expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. So they can seem also seem rigid and inflexible. <laughs> their motto is discipline is my freedom. Then there are questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. So they resist anything arbitrary, inefficient, unjustified. If it makes sense to them, they'll do it no problem. They'll meet that inner standard. But if it fails their inner standard, they'll push back. So their motto is, I'll comply if you convince me why. <laughs> then there are obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. So I got my first insight to this when I was having lunch with a friend and she said, it's weird. I know if I'm happier when I exercise. And when I was in high school on the track team, I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now on my own? Well, it's because when she had a team and a coach expecting her to show up, no problem. When she's trying to go on her own, then it's a struggle. So the motto for the obliger is, you can count on me, and I'm counting on you <laughs> to count on me. And then finally, rebels. Rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they choose to do, anything they want to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And they typically don't tell themselves what to do. Like they don't sign up for a 10 a.m. spin class on Saturday because they think, I don't know what I'm going to want to do when I wake up on Saturday. And just the idea that it's on the calendar is going to annoy me. So their motto is, you can't make me and neither can I. <laughs> now, if you're listening to this and you don't know what tendency you are, take the quiz. Yes. Yes, it's free. It's quick. More than 3.2 million people have taken the quiz. I just That's amazing. I, it is amazing. I just did like a big redesign. So it's like it's the same questions, but it's fresh. And yeah, so that said, if you go to quiz.gretchenrubin.com, you can take that quiz and it will give you an answer and like a little report. The thing is, then it doesn't tell you about other people's tendencies, which I find that people are often just yes. as interested in other people's tendencies. But it does tell you your own tendency. Yes. And I think the biggest takeaway, Gretch, for me from the four tendencies is that people need different approaches. Different people need different approaches to get done what they want to get done. And that's okay. But if you know what you need, then you can, you know, you can accomplish things that you wouldn't otherwise accomplish. Well, no, and like a funny example, I was mentioning the tackle box before. So the tackle box is like a great example of that. So there's the to-do list for the person who likes to make the list. There's the could-do list because rebels don't like to be told what they should do, mm -hmm. but they'll think about what they could do. And then there's the to-da list because a lot of times obligers, 
they need to be reminded of everything they've done in the past. And that like gives them energy to go forward in the future. And then there's to doodle for people who don't even want to keep a list. And today for people who are like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed. I can't think about all the things I need to do. I just want to think about today. And so it's like you can pick and choose what works for you. And Alyssa, we hear from this from listeners all the time that sometimes people get really discouraged with themselves and they feel like there's something wrong with them because somebody else can like get up early at 7 a.m. and work on their PhD thesis for two hours yeah. before work. And like, well, why can't I do that? It's like not every tool works for every person. Like we've all got to figure it out for ourselves. Yeah. Yes. Now we got a funny question from a listener um, on social media. Rebecca said, tell me why questioners don't like to be questioned. I'm one and I don't like it. Well, Rebecca, this is a great question because it is. many people have said, hey, isn't it ironic that questioners often don't like to be questioned? This isn't true of all questioners, but speaking like my husband, Jamie, like I'd absolutely noticed this aspect of his personality before I realized there was a fairly common phenomenon among questioners. I think it's partly they've done so much thinking, they don't like to have to rehearse it again. They don't like feeling like someone is opening up the door that perhaps they made the wrong call because they feel so confident in their judgment. And I think at least, at least in Jamie's case, he doesn't want to open it up for discussion. He's decided right. what he thinks is the way forward, and he just wants that to be. He feels very confident. If I think he feels like sometimes like if he tells me, then I might start arguing for my own position. Yes. I got to say... It's a little annoying. It is. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's what it is, Gretchen. It's like a questioner has done the research. So yeah. they're like, I know what the best flight is to take. Yes. So why is this person asking me yes. if there are any other flights that we yes. might take? I have right. determined this is the best yes. one. This is unnecessary discussion. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I think when you question, they feel like somehow you don't trust them. Where are we going to dinner? Well, I made yeah. a good reservation. You don't need yeah. to worry about it. Why are you asking exactly. me? The, and yeah. that's exactly the kind of information Jamie won't give me. Where are we going to dinner? A restaurant. What kind of food is it? Good food. That's exactly what he does. I know. There are things about each tendency that are annoying, though. So we all have our annoying cross to bear. We do. We all have our quirks <laughs> and, and uh, idiosyncrasies as part of our tendency. Michelle says, how can a rebel lose weight? All I do is rebel against myself, even though I know what to do. I keep resisting myself. Now, this is a classic rebel problem. This is a classic, classic rebel challenge. And I have to say, I've spoken to so many rebels about this because it comes up in so many contexts. I want to quit smoking. I want to write every single day. I want to finish my PhD thesis. I want to go, you know, I want to regularly run. How do they get themselves to do something if no one can tell them what to do, not even themselves? So this is a very common challenge. And here's a bunch of solutions that rebels have come up with. One is one of the core values of rebel is identity. So you think about your identity. So you're not doing this for any reason other than you're a healthy person, or you're a person who loves fresh, unprocessed food, or you like everything just the way you want it. You're doing it because it's your identity to be that way. Also, I talked to a rebel who thought about freedom for rebels, freedom and choice is very important. And so she said, I realized, you know, I'm not traveling the way I like to. I don't feel free to travel because it's really uncomfortable for me to like get on an airplane or like walk up and down the steps of a bus. I don't feel as free as I want to and I can't move around the way I want to. So she tied it to this idea of freedom. Another one is individuality. A lot of times rebels like to do things in their own way. And so like I have a friend, I, I'm a very, very low carb eater. And I like doing that as sort of an upholder because I like just executing on that way of eating. But if a friend who's a rebel and he does it because he's like, everybody says, how can you quit sugar? Oh, yeah, nobody can do that. <laughs> and so he's like, oh, you know, it's like, I've got to do it my way. Another thing is not feeling controlled. So it's sort of like this idea that like big food companies can't push my buttons with their mm. campaigns and their crinkly packages and their bright colors. They can't get in my head and make me do what they want, which is like to go out and buy that food. One of the funniest yeah. ones, I thought this is hilarious. One rebel said to me that every single morning she eats one piece of candy. Because it's like, it's so obviously oh, not what yeah. you're supposed to do to eat candy first thing in the morning. She's like, oh, as long funny. as I've shown myself, 
I'm free to do whatever I want. Then the rest of the day, I'm like, I choose to eat healthfully because that's what I want. But but nobody's making me do it because here I am eating candy in the morning. Yeah, it seems like Michelle just needs to let go of the notion this is something she should do and yes. more just grab this is who she is or something she wants to do. Try to mentally take the obligation out of it. Absolutely. The final thing I would say is challenge. Sometimes Rebels like it's a challenge. Like, mm. I'll show you. You don't think I could do this for 365 days or kind of a challenge like that. And one thing to remember is if the people around you are trying to encourage you or remind you or nudge you, you might tell them, hey, step back, because those kinds of messages can ignite the spirit of resistance in a rebel. So you want to make sure that you're doing this because this is what you want. This is what you choose. And you're not getting interference from anybody else. So good luck. Yes. Good luck, Michelle. All right, Gretch, coming up, we're going to talk about spotting the four tendencies on TV, but first this break. Okay, Gretch, we are back talking about the four tendencies on the fifth anniversary of the book coming out. And you and I talk about how easy it is sometimes to spot the four tendencies. Uh, Yes. We both love Mad Men after I made you watch it. We are Game of Thrones fans. And you can spot the tendencies in both of those shows. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to go through each character, I'll post a link in the episode notes to the bonus episodes, one that we did on Mad Men, one that we did on Game of Thrones. And I also have done a couple of roundups because I just Uh do love spotting the tendencies. So I'll post links to those two if you want to just see if you agree or, or look for yourself. I have this new and improved Four Tendencies hub, so I'll post a link to that. But if you see new ones, because I'm mm. I'm constantly adding to my list, put it on social media with hashtag tendency spotting, because I love getting new additions to my great compendium of tendencies. Yeah, it's so fun. All right, Gretchen, let me ask you this. If you had to pick one thing, what do you think is the most valuable aspect or, let's say, insight you've gotten from the four tendencies? If I had to pick one thing, I think it's that obligers need outer accountability to meet inner expectations. So Mm -hmm. it's like if you want to read more, it's not that you need to make time for self-care or reassess your priorities or learn to put yourself first. It's really just like join a book group or... Whatever, there's so many ways to create outer accountability once you know that's what you need. And that seems to be the thing that works for obligers. Yeah, and obligers, we should mention, is the biggest group. Yes, right. So that impacts the most people. I mean, I put this to use today, Gretchen. I wanted to hike this morning, and I knew there's no way I would do it unless I had a friend. So I put out the call last night. I got someone who said, if you go at 7.15, I'll go. And I said, oh, okay, I'll go at 7.15. And we went. And sure enough, I woke up in the morning and I thought, why did I do this? Yeah. <laughs> this is horrendous. I want to sleep. I don't want to go. Yeah. And I thought, well, she's planning on it, so I better show up. And I went and had a nice hike. So, you know, just today I used the four tendencies. But see, and knowing that you need that outer accountability, because otherwise you might have thought there's just so many ways to interpret it. No, I wouldn't have gone through that step. I would have just said, oh, I'll get up in the morning and go hiking and listen to a podcast. Right. It'll be easier at 8 a.m. I'll have more energy. And then related to that is obliger rebellion, which is when obligers meet, meet, meet expectations, and then suddenly they snap, and either they won't do something little and kind of funny, or it's something huge, like I'm quitting my job, or getting a divorce, or ending a 20-year friendship. I mean, we've talked about obliger rebellion a lot. It's a big subject. I think that's been really helpful for a lot of people because it can feel very mysterious. Mm. Where did this come from? I feel like I'm acting out of character. I don't understand why I make one comment and this person refuses to speak to me. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, right. ooh, but if you understand Obliged Rebellion, it does make sense. And so I feel mm-hmm. like I feel like that's really helpful. And Gretchen, we heard from so many people about how the four tendencies had improved their lives. Yeah. Here's what Shireen said. As an upholder, it has helped me become more empathetic toward others. I have stopped judging people who can't just do what they say they want to do, even though it's important to them. 
I now know how to communicate better with other tendencies by aligning my conversations in a way that works with their tendency that I've guessed through observation. This has been so important in my marriage to an obliger. I used to think that he thought of others above me until I realized I was an extension of self. Yes, I could ask yes, for things yes. in a way that stressed the importance to me rather than seeing him go above and beyond for other people and reasons I could not understand. Most importantly, learning my tendency has allowed me to stop and ask why I'm doing something and live life more intentionally. It's so easy for me to internalize other people's expectations and live by them without consciously knowing it. The framework has honestly changed my life so much for the better. I mean, this so resonated with me as an upholder, yes. I have to say. And this was funny with Kelly. She's like in a group where they talk about it, which I get the biggest kick out of it. She said, I'm an obliger and have a monthly dinner group with two other obligers. Our three husbands are all questioners, so we commiserate and come up with techniques of how to deal with them. Many times we tell our husbands that they only get to ask a certain number of questions or that we would appreciate an answer to our question before they mm. reply with another question. Well, this goes back to our thing about questioners don't like to answer yeah. questions. We've also worked on rewording our questions to them. Instead of saying, can you buy some milk? We now say, can you stop at the grocery store tonight? We are completely out of milk and I need it for a recipe tomorrow. That helps mm. the questioner husband understand the reason why we need them to stop tonight. When I'm researching something new to both my husband and me, I've learned to include my source links for articles I've read about how I came to those choices. We just finished a house remodel with many decisions on purchases. In choosing a ceiling fan, I listed which features were most important and a few links, then gave my husband a top three, and we decided together. Mm. I'm married to a question yes. myself. I get it, I get it, I get it. Carla says, I'm a cybersecurity professor, and I have my students take the four tendencies quiz so that I can provide more evidence for questioners and calm down when they seem to be challenging things and more support for obligers. I am a rebel, and I tell fellow rebels they will have to use identity if taking the class was their idea to begin with, or consequences if it was forced upon them. Sometimes people need the degree because of others. The upholders just do the thing, but are pretty rare. Most students enjoy the insight. Well, that's so great. It's so gratifying to me to hear about people putting these into action and finding benefits from it. I yes. heard of families doing it at Thanksgiving dinner as like a family exercise. Well, and we've heard of many doctors, Gretchen, who use Many it. doctors, many doctors, Always physical therapists, nurses, nutritionists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and speaking of that, as I said, I had this great new hub um, at GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies. And there are articles and PDF downloads there about using it at work, using the framework in healthcare, using it with children, with sweethearts. There are interviews there if you want to hear from. I I've been interested in how much people like to hear interviews with somebody of a particular tendency. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if you want to change a habit, there's information there. If you want to go deeper, I have my Four Tendencies course, which you can do in five weeks or go at your own pace. And so for that, if you want to know more about the courses specifically, you can go to courses.gretchenrubin slash 4TC or the hub again is gretchenrubin.com slash 4Tendencies. But all these links will be in the episode notes. And let us know how using the Four Tendencies works for you. Let us know on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Drop us an email at podcast at GretchenRubin.com. Or as always, go to the show notes. This is happiercast.com slash 394 for everything related to this episode and all those resources. All right, coming up, we have a Four Tendencies hack. But first, this break. Okay, Gretchen, we are back with this week's happiness hack. And it's a Four Tendencies hack. Yeah, so many, many people have asked me for like a flash evaluation. They want to know someone's tendency, but they either don't feel comfortable asking them to take the quiz or the people refuse to take the quiz. For example, questioners are like, why should I waste my time taking some quiz? Or rebels are like, I'm not going to take a quiz just because you tell me to. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And then sometimes it's just not polite. You can't just march over to somebody and be like, yes. hey, would you take this quick really quiz? Really wondering why you act the way you act. Please yeah, take right, right, right. Or you're, you're on a date or you're at a yeah. cocktail party or something. So people have said, is there a quick informal method? So there's a whole flash evaluation, again, on that hub that I was just talking about. So if you want the whole thing, you can get the PDF there. 
But here I'll just mention two of, I think, the most helpful questions. And what you got to keep in mind is that you're not looking for a specific answer, that there are a few words that are often like really strong signals. You're trying to listen for their rationale. How are they thinking about this question? Because you can listen for their justifications and their arguments. Then you will start to see the tendency. You see how they're thinking about the question. But I will say, because the tendencies overlap, sometimes people of two tendencies might answer the same way. That's why you often need to ask a couple of questions so that you can really get it down from that two. It's pretty easy usually to narrow it down to two. It's harder to do for four. Also, if you're trying to figure out someone's tendency, just on the numbers basis, the biggest tendency is obliger. The second biggest tendency is questioner. So if you're thinking questioner or obliger, that's kind of where the numbers fall. Mm. So that's also something to think about. So what are the questions that you ask? Okay. So the first question, and the, and the wording is important, right? I've worked very carefully on the wording. It's how do you feel about New Year's resolutions? It's not do you keep New Year's resolutions. Right. It's how do you feel about New Year's resolutions? Because upholders will express a lot of enjoyment. They like them. Maybe they make resolutions at other times, but they kind of like the idea of New Year's resolutions. They'll be positive. Questioners might say that they make resolutions, but they will often say things like, January 1st is an arbitrary date, or it wouldn't be efficient for me to wait until a specific day to start my resolutions. So they're talking about justifications and like things not being arbitrary. Obligers will often say they don't like the idea of New Year's resolutions, that they feel discouraged. They might often say things like, I used to make them, but I don't anymore because I've so often let myself down. Or if they say they do keep them, they might say, well, but but often I can't keep them. So they have a very sort of ambivalent or negative feeling about New Year's resolutions. And then rebels are just like, yeah, I don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Unless they do it in sort of a challenge, like somebody thought I couldn't go an entire year without drinking alcohol. And I said, I'll show you. So that is kind of like a rebel way of thinking about it. There's a very strong challenge, a very strong mm. I'll show you. But in general, rebels find it fun or they enjoy the challenge. But typically they don't make those kinds of right. resolutions because they don't bind themselves. Yeah, they don't want to be confined by a resolution. Right. right, they want to be spontaneous. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And Gretch, give us an example of one of the other questions. Okay, this one's kind of funny. So you say to the person, imagine you and I are in a coffee shop and there's no one around and we're sort of in the back room and there's a sign on the wall that says, no cell phones. And I pull out my cell phone and I start using it. How would you feel about that? So mm. upholders would be like, I would feel very uncomfortable. They don't like that. There's yeah. a sign. You're doing it. Don't do it. Questioners would sort of analyze it. They'd be like, well, does it make sense? Is there any reason? Like if we were in a hospital and it would interfere with equipment, that would be one thing. But if, you're, if this rule just doesn't make any sense or there's no harm, I wouldn't bother them to see somebody breaking that rule. So it's all about like, well, what's the justification for the rule? Obligers might say they'd feel uncomfortable, but they might point to sort of others like, well, other people get annoyed if you're in a coffee shop on your cell phone or somebody might reprimand you for using a phone when it's against the rules. So it's like those outer expectations have yes. to be taken into consideration. And rebels would be like, oh, they don't care. They don't care. If you want to use your phone, use your phone. They might even get a kick out of you breaking the rule, but they certainly mm -hmm. would have no objection to use it. You, the, the fact that there's a sign on the wall for something like that. No, they don't care. Yeah, I would say for me, an obliger, for sure, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. That 100%, I would be worried about getting in trouble. So I yeah. fall into this. And I, as an upholder, I'm like, even if I knew I weren't going to get in trouble, it would just bother me. Totally. Uh, there's a rule here. So again, if you want the whole evaluation, you can go to GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies, and it's on the hub. And Elizabeth, we got a great Four Tendencies tip from the listener, Joe. And he said that he he's a questioner who tips to rebel, but maybe he's actually a rebel. Let's see. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm a longtime reader, listener, and follower of yours. I'm a questioner who tips to rebel and have been noticing what strategies I can successfully employ to get myself to do things, especially things I don't really want to do. 
One, do something at the, quote, wrong time. I often resist doing something at the appropriate or expected time and can end up doing it at the last minute, which isn't ideal for obvious reasons. If I do something extremely preemptively, it somehow seems very subversive and satisfying. (laughs) Other times I might do something optional at the wrong or unexpected time, like cleaning the bathroom just before bed when others in the family are relaxing. Love it. Two, mise en place. I tell myself I don't have to do X. I'm not actually doing X. I'm just assembling the items for when I decide to do X. This reduces friction and makes it seem more doable. And before I know it, I have finished the task. Three, what I don't want to happen. A light bulb went off when I reread The Happiness Project and got to the part of your definition about reducing drags on your happiness. If I keep in mind how much I hate certain things happening, I will work really hard to avoid them. For example, like certain people, I really hate being woken up by an alarm, so I try to make sure I go to bed at such a time that I wake up early without an alarm. Yeah, I think these are great ideas, whether you're a question or rebel or anybody. I think this is really, really helpful. The thing that makes me feel that this person is a rebel (laughs) is that rebels often will do something at kind of the wrong time Mm -hmm. and drive by hack. If you are in work or in life partnered with a rebel, if they're starting to do something, never say to them like, oh, this isn't the best time for that. It'll be better to wait for tomorrow. It'd be more efficient to do another time. Let them do things in their own time. Never tell them to wait for a better time because if they're choosing to do it now, step out of the way. Yes. I love the idea of cleaning the bathroom before bed. There's just something funny about it. It is. Well, maybe it's also that kind of gamification that kills people as well. And Elizabeth, the merits and gold stars. This is an even numbered episode, which is your demerit. Yes. Okay. So this is probably some sort of obliger demerit, Gretch. Mm. It is the beginning of the school year. And my demerit that is that I have not put all the important school dates on the calendar. Mm. And I have not signed up for the new lunch program. And mm-hmm. there's, I did manage to get Jack's books because they said, if you don't, they'll sell out. But it's See, all those this. beginning of year things that I just feel overwhelmed by, and I know life will be better if I put them in the calendar, but I haven't. But I think if there's that outer accountability where they were like, if your child is not signed up for the new lunch program, your child will go hungry on Thursday. Yes. It's like, you would do it in a flash. Yes, but it yeah. really, instead, it's if you want it because they can bring their lunch, so you mm. know it's not really necessary. Anyway, yes, I need someone to say that and then I will do it immediately. Well, I think we've all done it. Like the start of school, there's so much, there's so much paperwork and busy work. Like you, your child's other parent, everybody's taking bits and pieces of it. And there's still all this stuff that just, it's a lot to get done to start the school year. So no, I mean, yes, we've all and done it, it is my arena. This yeah. is what I've taken on. So I don't feel like I could say, hey, Adam, put all these things in the calendar. Right. Well, like he does the uniform. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Same thing. So, Jamie and I, it's like he does his things and I do my things. And yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Adam has done his part, which has got us a closet full of new uniforms, but I am lacking, Gretch. So yeah. hopefully this will create some kind of feeling of accountability and I will put those dates in the calendar and sign up for all the th- many things I need to sign up for. But what about you, Gretch? What is your gold star this week? I'm giving a gold star to you because you are like, you have become like a four tendencies expert. I've heard you talking about it. I'm like, dang, she knows her stuff. I couldn't have given a better answer myself. You in many ways are the willing uh, accomplice to so many of my like little experiments and, and, and frameworks. And, you know, I'm constantly testing things out on you. Remember the whole, when I was going through the whole abstainer moderator thing, I made you have so many conversations with me about that. And now you, I just feel like you are a true four tendencies expert. Um, Oh, well, I I try. Thank you for your interest and your enthusiasm uh, and for your expertise. Well, I love the four tendencies. They work. Yeah. 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 Well, the resources for this week, we've talked about so many resources. So again, I'll put all the links. This is happiercast.com slash 394. Also, another way to use your tendency is through the Happier app, which is my award-winning app. And it has all kinds of content to help you foster self-knowledge, put it to use, use your four tendencies as you're trying to work on your habits. So go to thehappierapp.com 
to learn more and to download the app. And then also book plates. If you want to give a copy of The Four Tendencies book to someone, or, or really any book, it, like the book plates go with any book, or you want it for yourself, you can request as many as you want within reason, only in the U.S. and Canada, unfortunately, because these are actual physical things that I will mail to you, to put in the names if you want the book plates to be personalized and the address to which I will mail them. Go to GretchenRubin.com slash resources. And if you click request a signed book plate under mm. podcast resources, you can sign up. Elizabeth, what are we reading? What are you reading? I am reading The Best Seller Code by Jody Archer and Matthew L. Jockers. I am reading The Fortnight in September by R.C. Sheriff. And that's it for this episode of Happier. Remember to try this at home. Use the four tendencies. Let us know if you tried the framework and if it worked for you. Love your insights, questions, observations. Bring it on. Thank you to our executive producer, Chuck Reed, and everyone at Cadence 13. Get in touch. Gretchen's on Instagram at Gretchen Rubin, and I'm at Liz Craft. Our email address is podcast at GretchenRubin.com. If you like the show, please be sure to tell a friend. That's how most people hear about us. Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Craft. And I'm Gretchen Rubin. Thank you for joining us. Onward and upward. Gretch, I forgot to ask you this. We always ask people what surprised them the most with the book they wrote. What surprised you the most about The Four Tendencies? Well, it's kind of before that because so I, I discovered The Four Tendencies when I was writing my book Better Than Before, which is all about oh. how to make and break habits. And what surprised me is I thought I had discovered so many exciting, juicy, helpful things about how to form habits. And all anybody wanted to talk about or ask about was the four tendencies. Oh. And then I was, and that's when I was like, maybe I need to write a whole book about the four tendencies yeah. because I did not realize that was going to be the thing that really captured people's interest. I mean, oh, all this stuff in the, I love everything and better than before. There's so much great stuff in there, but I was surprised at how much people really did mm. get interested in the four tendencies. Yeah. Well, whenever I tell people about them, they go off and take the quiz. It's a natural interest. Oh, what a good sister. Thanks so much for watching our podcast here on YouTube. If you're enjoying it, please hit subscribe right below the video. It really helps the show. From the Onward Project.